it for the Step Outside podcast brought to you here at the School of Natural Resources at the University of Tennessee Institute of Agriculture. Today joining me is Ashley Epstein. Ashley, you're a master's student, or excuse me, you are getting your master's in wildlife and fishery science while here at the school. Correct. Yeah. And you've been researching the eastern red bat. Yes, correct. So what kind of, how did you get into that research? So. I kind of stumbled into it actually. So I did my undergrad at UT as well. And throughout my undergrad, I was volunteering in Dr. Emma Wilcox's lab with her other grad students. Um, They were looking for volunteer technicians to help on some research. And that was kind of my first dip into wildlife and fisheries. And once I got in it, I just kind of fell in love with the bats. And when I was getting ready to graduate with my bachelor's, um, the Nature Conservancy who funded my project actually approached Emma and I and they were like, hey, we have this idea for a project. Do you have a grad student? And I was like, yes, I will stick around and I'll do it. And just kind of took off from there. But I've kind of been involved with bats for like the six years that I've been at UT and it's just been great. This is Ada. It sounds like it all just kind of worked out perfectly. It did. It did. It just kind of fell into place because I had initially I wasn't really interested in graduate school, um, non traditional student. So I was like, you know, I'm going to get my bachelor's. I'm going to go to work, get a job. So this kind of stumbled into my lap, and it's been really great. And I've enjoyed the the whole experience. And I'm kind of glad that things worked out the way that they did because it's been really, really amazing time. As far as the project goes, are you looking at anything specific to that project? Yeah, so eastern red bats, they're pretty common, um, at least they used to be, um, not a listed species at all, so we don't really know a ton about them. There is research out there, you know, looking at their summer roosting and, and that stuff, but specifically what we wanted to know was what is their roosting like in the wintertime? and also foraging activity. What is that like in the winter time? Because those are things that haven't really been studied extensively. Um, and we kind of fell into it because the, um, the, the Nature Conservancy people who had approached us with the project, um, he was a burn boss on a prescribed fire crew. And when they were out doing their winter burns, they were seeing all of these red bats like flying away from the fire. And he wanted to know what was going on were their management activities impacting this species? Like, do we need to do anything different when we're doing our winter burns? So essentially what we wanted to know is where are they roosting? How likely are those areas to be burned? And is it possible that the species is gonna be impacted by those dormant season fires? And then as far as foraging, we were just looking into seeing is there more activity after there's been a burn or in stands that never get burned um so that was kind of the the focus of of the project and it shifted a little bit you know as we got out there because a lot of this we kind of made up as we went um so there's a lot of trial and error to see what was going to work what wasn't going to work um so it's it shifted a little bit but the main focus has kind of stayed the same as far as that goes and when did the project start We started officially in October of 2021. Okay. So you've been working on it for a couple years now. Yes. Yeah, I just finished up the last field season in May of this past year, actually. May of 23 was the last. Nice. Okay. And so right now I'm assuming you're compiling all all your data and all the results from that research. Yeah, right now is kind of the not fun sit in front of the computer like no field work part um but i actually have enjoyed it especially the acoustics looking at the acoustic part of it um, which is how we did the the foraging aspect we used uh, acoustic detectors and that's been really really interesting to me because i found a lot of really interesting stuff just by looking at the the call files and we're looking at feeding buzzes and you know you can't target a specific species when you are using these detectors so I've gotten a lot of really interesting species calls on my acoustics that I never expected to see especially in the winter time and especially the areas where I was in Um, so that's been really really interesting I really enjoyed it I'm thinking maybe career trajectory potentially I don't know we'll see (laughs) Um, so the project, as far as prescribed burns go, mm-hmm. have you discovered anything on um, delaying prescribed burns, maybe doing them earlier? What are your results so far? So it seems that, so the, 
most of the research that has been done looking at how these bats are aware that they need to flee, it's connected to smoke. So these bats are being triggered by smoke before the fire even gets to them. And there was one study done several years ago, um, but it was in a controlled setting. Um, they used flight cages, but essentially what they discovered was it takes anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes for these bats to completely arouse enough that they can fly away. And that arousal time is based on temperature. So what we were thinking is, okay, so potentially what that means is we just need to burn during times when it's a little bit warmer at night. Nobody really knows what the threshold is. My bats are they were choosing to drop from their tree roost and go to the ground anytime when the temperature was below around 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so I was like, okay, well maybe we do these burns, you know, when we have consecutive nights that are above 45 degrees. Well, when I went back and looked at all of my sites that had been burned and looked at the burn rotation, the time period when those areas are being burned it's not typically when it's that cold outside. So it, ha it doesn't seem to be have an impact. Most of the impact that I'm finding is based on um, habitat management, creating better habitat, so opening up flight space. Uh, red bats are, they're large bodied bats. They don't really do well flying through a lot of clutter. They like big open areas. So they are forest bat, they roost in the forest, but typically, the research shows that they don't like a lot of clutter and, and that sort of stuff. Um, my roosting data is kind of suggesting otherwise, however, the areas where they are, where it has been burned, there's open corridors where they can easily leave from their roost and get to their foraging habitat. So I think, based on the data that I have, it's mostly habitat management, opening up flight space, creating better foraging areas for these bats. I don't really think that what we're doing burn-wise is having a huge impact as far as population goes. I don't think we're just like burning up bats or things, you know, when we're, when we're doing these burns. And it sounds almost as if those prescribed burns are helping yes. with the bats because it's, get, like you said, it's freeing up that clutter. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I think that it is helping them. And you know, something else, if you look at the timing of our prescribed burns, when we do them in the Southeast, it's usually, they call them non-growing season burns. Um, so we say winter, but it's not always technically in the winter months, right? So we're doing this in like October, November, and then from December, January, February, you might do a couple, but they don't do tons. But then in like March and April, then we start doing more burns. And by that time, those nightly temperatures are warm enough that these bats are not in torpor. They're, you know, they're able to get up and realize, hey, I should probably go to the next, the next side over. So I really think that the fire is helping and my acoustic data is kind of suggesting that as well. When you look at my, like, the stands that have not been burned versus stands that were recently burned, there's way more calls, there's way more activity in the recently burned stands, which to me suggests that that's creating some kind of influx in insect prey, and so these bats are choosing to forage in these recently burned areas, even if something very similar that hasn't been burned is very close by. So I do, I do think that the, the fire is helping the species, yeah. And you mentioned torpor earlier. Yes. Just for people who might not understand what that is, could you kind of go into that a yeah. little bit? Yeah, so torpor is basically a form of hibernation. Um, basically, these bats lower their metabolic activities, their metabolic rate, um, and they drop their core body temperature to match the ambient temperature outside. And it's just a way for them to conserve energy. Flight is very energetically expensive, especially for mammals, because they're not built like birds. Um, but even in birds, flight is a very energetically expensive activity. So in the winter, when, and you know, the bats that we have in, in Tennessee and most of the US are insectivorous bats. They eat insects, they eat bugs. Those things, there's not a lot of that on the landscape when it's really, really cold outside. So it doesn't make sense for them to constantly be flying around for just a little bit of prey because that's not going to keep them going at night after night after night. So they'll just go into this state of torpor, which is basically hibernation. It's just a way for them to, to conserve energy. Um, red bats, though, they are known, even if it's 
I don't know, like it's January and it's been below freezing for a week. If we get one warm night, these bats will wake up from their torpor and they'll forage and then they'll go back into torpor if it gets cold again. But they are a species that is known to kind of forage in the winter and, you know, try to get as much as they can. So because they're in those torpor those months mostly in the winter like you said we usually aren't burning then anyway right and if there is a rare time you know because I did um, when I first started the project um, I was regularly going on burns just to see if I could myself observe what these burn bosses these burn practitioners were seeing um, and there were a couple burns that we did um, in like January but they were it was so rare because the weather just isn't it's just not right usually for burns. Um, most of the burns that I participated in were either in October, September, October time frame, or starting in March, like that early spring, late winter, early spring time frame. So usually, you know, these guys, they're in torpor November, December, January, February. If we get a cold snap in March or April, you know, they're gonna go and do what they need to do to stay warm and conserve energy. But for the most part during that time, you know, they're already awake and, and they're doing their thing. Red bats are also a migratory species. They're long distance uh, migratory bat. Um, so they'll migrate, you know, pretty, pretty far to get to kind of like birds, you know, get to their warmer places in the winter time. But we also have resident populations. So those bats that don't migrate, they just, they're like, I'm here, I'm gonna chill. Um, so also during that time period when we're doing a lot of our burns, these bats have already migrated to their different areas, their wintering areas where they're going to be for the winter. Um, so the population that is still here is much less than, you know, what it is in the summertime or spring when they actually migrate back and, you know, get to their summer habitat and things like that. Um, so again, I, I don't... I don't know that I have data that proves that fire is bad for this species. To me, in my head, like when I look at my data and the more I think about it and the more you le read the literature and see what other people have discovered about this species, it almost seems to me like they might be a fire adapted species, so they kind of depend on fire for, for, um, for like their full habitat needs, you know? Because like I said, we're opening up flight space we're attracting insects, we're creating corridors, you know, things like that. Um, and yeah, I just, I think that it's more beneficial than it is a hindrance. I don't think that's something we need to worry about when we're looking at conserving the species. I think fire is a good way to do it, to create more habitat. The biggest threat to the species that we're facing right now is wind energy. They're really impacted by wind turbines. Um, that's uh, red bats, holy bats, silver-haired bats, most of the, they're in the genus Lazarus, um, and they fly really high, um, so, and they fly in these big open spaces, which is normally where we have these big windmills and stuff. Um, so that's the biggest threat to them. I don't think that when we're looking at conservation of red bats, I don't think that fire needs to be one of those things that we're like, ooh, we should not do it. I think we should do it. I think it's helping. Well, and you brought up how that also attracts insects, and bats are really good at kind of controlling, I guess, well, not controlling insects in our environment, but kind of keeping it stable. Yeah, yeah, so bats are responsible for, it's an estimated, like their monetary worth, if you want to put it into, because people always try to monetize, like our wildlife, so what does it contribute? So it's estimated in the billions of dollars of agricultural pest control every single year. Um, these bats are really good at you know, catching insects and most of them have a pretty wide diet range that they'll eat. Um, red bats, they are partial to Lepidoptera, so butterflies and moths and things, but we do have invasive moth species that are bad for some of our trees, our oak species of trees and things like that. So, you know, having these guys on the landscape is really beneficial because it can reduce the amount of pesticide that we need to use and, you know, they're really good pollinators, bats are, seed dispersers, so having them on the landscape is, is really important for multiple different reasons that directly affect us, you know. I know you said it's, well, earlier you were saying it's a common bat, but not as common as it used to be. Yeah. So this whole project and conservation, 
Um, I'm a, well, obviously it's to uh, boost their population, but does it also have anything to do with the larger environment? Yeah, so the thing about this project is, so red bats, they don't use caves, they don't use buildings. In the winter time, you can miss net in a cave. There's gonna be bats coming out to check and forage and things like that. It's really easy to block off the entrance to a cave and, and catch bats. Red bats don't do that, so we're misnetting on the landscape, which is really not an easy thing to do in the winter because bats are just not active a lot in the winter time. Even these guys who are known to forage during the winter, they're not as active, and you gotta pick that perfect night to make sure that they're gonna be out flying around on the landscape. Also, as a solitary bat, they don't roost in huge colonies like a lot of our other bat species. They just go out and they're on their own. They only come together when they're swarming for mating or if you find a mom with her pups. Until those pups are volant and they're flying off and they're on their own, she'll be with them. But then after that, it's kind of like everybody for themselves. So it's really difficult to do population studies on a species like this um, for those reasons. Difficult to catch in the winter time and they're solitary, so you're not finding large groups of them together, so you can't, it's really difficult to monitor, like, okay, this colony seems to be thriving, this colony seems to be doing well, because there just isn't a colony of them together. But if you look back, like even 10, 15 years in the literature, you see these reports of like people catching huge numbers of red bats, and even, in the six years that I've been doing this, I've noticed that, you know, we used to catch a lot of red bats in the summertime, a lot, a lot, a lot of red bats, and then as the years have gone on, we're still catching them more than other species, but it's not nearly, so it would be like nothing to catch 20 red bats in a night, and now it's like we caught 15 over the whole summer type of thing. So I've noticed, you know, just through that, that there does seem to be a decline and people have studied through their, we know that they migrate, right? And there have been people who've reported like, oh, we used to see large amounts of bats migrating through the area and you just don't see that anymore. Because they are also a species that has been observed migrating during the day, which is pretty unique for a bat. Um, but they'll just kind of go from one place to another and you don't really see that anymore. You don't really see tons of reports of that anymore in the literature. Um, so it does seem that they're declining, but because they're not listed, not a ton of research has gone into them. And I do think, you know, from an environmental standpoint, keeping common species common is really important because, you know, if you look at, say, the tricolored bat or the little brown bat, those two species are really affected by white nose syndrome. And it wasn't until they're all gone that we're like, we need to figure out what they need habitat-wise so that we can conserve them. And by that point, it's really hard to get that information because there's not enough individuals on the landscape to get that information. So keeping common species common, or at least finding out what they need while they're common, can help us prepare to protect them later if something did happen and we did notice like, where are all these bats going? Well, this is what they need. Let's go ahead and create this kind of environment for them and see if we get a boost in the population in these areas where we're creating that environment. Um, and, you know, again, just from a an economic standpoint they do a lot for they're re really great to have around farms and red bats you know they like this edge and they like to forage in like pastures and like really open areas so if you're on a farm it's completely open you've got these guys flying over your crops or whatever I mean I, I see that as a plus because then it's less work for you you know but the less of them we have the less insects they're going to be able to eat which is going to be more pests on the landscape you know, so it's kind of, I feel like it's just like this snowball effect, you know. Earlier you were talking about how um, right now looking at the data and thinking about how it could, uh, um, how it could advance your career or at least yeah. put you in a certain direction. Have you given much thought to that? Yeah, I've, I have such a broad range of interest in wildlife which has been good for me because it's opened up a lot of opportunities because I'm just like that looks like fun let me just do that and see if I enjoy it and I've enjoyed almost everything that I've tried <laughs> um, but it also has been difficult 
because then when I'm looking for jobs, it's like, okay, well, what do I apply for? Where do I fit? Where do I think that my skills are going to best serve and best do what I'm trying to do, which is make a difference? Um, so the more that I've been doing this research, because I do love bats, I would not be disappointed if I ended up in a career where I worked with bats. Um, but the more I sit down and look at this acoustic data and sit down and analyze these calls, the more I'm kind of like, I really like this and I'm good at this. And I think that if I had a job doing this, I would be very happy. And it would make me feel like I was doing something important. Um, it's just really cool. To, to sit down, obviously, most of the people who get into wildlife, we get into this field because we want to get our hands on critters. We want to hold animals. We want to be in the field doing that research, trapping stuff, looking at it, you know, all of the things. But I've done a lot of remote camera work and now this acoustic work, and I am very, very interested in these non-invasive techniques. I think that it's really cool. I think we can get a lot of information from things like cameras and acoustics because, you know, when we when we trap animals, we're putting them under stress. And I think that we still, obviously, we still get really great information from that. However, I do think that putting that stress on the animal and doing something that they're not accustomed to can kind of alter at least the first couple of days of data that we might get. We're using these non-invasive methods. We're not ever putting our hands on the animal. We're not doing anything that's going to disturb them or change the way that they might normally behave. So I think we can get a lot of really, really good, accurate information from these non-invasive species or non-invasive methods of tracking animals and looking at, at what they're doing. Um, and I, it's just really interesting. So I think if I could if I could right now choose what I would want to do, it would be something with either that, like acoustics or cameras or something, or I'm also very interested in migration. I think migration is really interesting. I think migration of bats is especially interesting because they're very small, but they can go very, very long distances in a very short amount of time, and I just think that that's really interesting. So um, if I could do something looking at migration of any of the long distance migrant bats, like a hoary bat or a red bat or a silver haired bat, I think that that would be really fun as well. And just kind of see compared to birds, like are they using specific flyways? Do they do, do they go, is there any kind of migratory connectivity? Like do all the Tennessee bats go to the same place in the winter and like the Kentucky bats go to a different place? Or, you know, how does that work? I think that that would be really, really interesting to look at too. And I don't know that, um, a ton of that has been done because um, using it's really hard with bats they're so small to get like transmitters and things that are safe for them um, but some modus work has been done using modus towers to do some migratory studies it's relatively new but I think that kind of getting into that I would really enjoy that I think that that would be really cool well those are all my questions that I have for you. Is there anything else you would like to add for anyone watching this month? I don't think so. I think that the biggest thing for me, you know, bats are are pretty misunderstood, and a lot of people don't have a positive look on bats, and I just would encourage people to just do some research and, and look at the benefits that they bring because they are there's way more benefits to having bats on the landscape than there are um, like negative things and I think that if more people understood how important they were even if you don't like them you don't have to like bats you don't have to love bats as much as I do but just having a healthy respect for what they do for the environment I think is a good place to start all right well thank you so much for joining me this month on the step outside podcast yeah thank you for having me I enjoyed it